Okay, Kim Scholars, if I'm being honest with you, this next section is really something that the College Board kind of shoehorned in there to be able to have another type of graph and, and uh, pictorial display type questions. Not to say that it doesn't have meaning, it's just something that was never emphasized until recently. So, with that in mind, this is going to be a short one. When we use the term intramolecular, we really mean something that's going on inside the molecule, and that's bonding. So this is really just a fancy way to talk about covalent bonds. The strengths of the intramolecular, intramolecular force depend on electronegativities, like we just talked about, uh, and also, of course, on the number of electrons being shared. A double bond is stronger than a single bond. A triple bond is stronger than both of those. So the fact that there are more electrons being shared allows the nuclei to pull in a little bit more uh, and, and make a stronger connection. So we do talk about the idea of bond length and that being a factor of bond order. Now bond order is a fancy word for how many bonds there are. So over here we see a single bond, so it's bond order is one. Here we have a triple bond, bond order is three. Here we have a double bond, bond order of two. When we talk about resonance, we'll come back to this at the end of the unit, so let's not get into that right now. But it is important to note that the bigger the bond order, the smaller the bond length. So even though these are all carbon-carbon bonds, this carbon-carbon bond is going to be the smallest, then this one, and then all the single ones would be uh, the biggest of the carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, So we can read bond length uh, based off of uh, inversely related to the bond order. You can notice in the chart here, you know, the carbon-carbon bond is 1.54, the double bond is 1.34, the triple bond is 1.20, just like I just uh, discussed with you. So there's nothing new, you know, it doesn't have to be carbon, same idea if we talk about nitrogens and so on and so forth. A uh, little reference, in case you don't know, this little A with a halo on top of it is called an angstrom. An angstrom is something like 10 to the negative 10th meters. It's in between nano and pico. It's only used sometimes in terms of bonds and bond lengths and things like that. So usually we just stick to the metric units. But you might see it pop up. If you do, it's just a special metric unit that was thrown out there for atoms. Um, so don't, don't stress over that. But again, this just represents the idea that we were talking about here about the strength of them based on the size of the atoms, but also then uh, the uh, uh, bond order. And by the way, size of the atoms, I, I should have emphasized. So if we compare a carbon-carbon to a carbon-nitrogen, carbon atoms are bigger than nitrogen atoms. So we see that the carbon-carbon bond length is bigger than the carbon-nitrogen bond length. Okay, I didn't emphasize that, and I really should. Oxygen is a little bit bigger than nitrogen, a little bit smaller than nitrogen. So you notice the carbon oxygen is, well, almost the same. Why would that be? That has to do with those exceptions that we talked about with oxygen and nitrogen in terms of ionization energy and whatnot. But technically, this number is slightly smaller than this if we went out another decimal place. All right, so in the unit, we're talking about potential energy. And potential energy is stored energy. If you've had physics already, then you know about something like gravitational potential energy or elastic potential energy. And sometimes it's referred to as positional energy because it depends on where the object is in relationship to something else. For example, the bow, when it has potential energy is when the string has been pulled away from the handle. And the car has gravitational potential when it is away from the Earth. Uh, same thing with the wrecking ball. So those are sometimes referred as positional uh, energies. And electrical energy is the same thing because electrical depends on attractions or repulsions between particles. And the closer or further away you get a, a will affect that potential energy. So again, the whole point of this from my view for the AP is just so that you can talk about this type of graph. An inter-nuclear uh, distance versus potential energy graph. 
So let's talk about what this means. So the potential energy you see says zero here, okay? And we see that it looks like it's decreasing as you go here, okay? Well, the atoms, as they start coming together, would start forming a bond. And when bonds are formed, you release energy. So that's why it's showing a negative potential energy because of the fact that energy would be released. However, if we continue to bring the atoms closer together, what we start doing is almost like taking two tennis balls and squishing them together Eventually, they're going to explode outward in the pulse, and it takes more and more energy to get them into that state. So you see that, the, you know, we have a positive energy once we go past the ideal. So what does the graph really tell us? Well, it tells us two things. It's going to tell us what the ideal bond length is for something, because that's where this hill is, okay? So this, or inverted hill, if you will is going to tell us exactly what the bond length should be, so we know where this peak or trough is, whichever way you want to talk about it. That represents bond length, but it's also going to tell us the bond enthalpy, because so how much energy is being released uh, as this, as we get to this point. And okay, so we're getting two things, bond enthalpy and bond length out of this. Uh, and again, that's about the basic idea. They might then ask you to compare it for different elements. Um, so, uh, but first let's, you know, take a little reading. What is the bond uh, length for the molecule depicted in the graph? And what is the bond enthalpy? All right, so the bond length, if the hill is here, we're somewhere in between over here, you know, so upper 60s, lower 70s uh, in terms of picometers. And uh, what is the uh, enthalpy, the bond enthalpy? Well, we're just below 400, so I'll say around negative 420 or so. Uh, and again, you would only be doing this for estimation's sake. And of course, the answers were technically 74 picometers and 432 kilograms per mole. Um, the, the negative there again is because when the bond is being made, energy is released. So that's why we see a negative, uh, and obviously it's represented here because we're below the axis, the x axis. Uh, another, this is, was from a past AP exam, a little modified. So we're told that this graph here represents a chlorine chlorine bond. Based on the shape of this graph, sketch the graph for a bromine bromine bond. So we have to understand a couple things. First off, sizes, okay? So if you compare chlorine and bromine, which one is the uh, bigger atom? And bromine is the bigger one. So that means when we talk about the bond length, we expect the bromine-bromine bond to be bigger. So I know that the curve, which is marked by point B, would have to be out further to the right. It's gotta have a bigger internuclear distance. So we know the curve has to be to the right. Let's talk about the potential energy then, okay? Because chlorine uh, is a smaller atom, it's gonna be much harder to remove electrons from chlorine. There would be much more energy involved in that. And if we talk about electron affinity, kind of the same idea. By bonding, they're gonna release more energy. So bromine's peak, uh, or trough, if you will, will actually be not as tall as, as uh, chlorine's. So we're expecting a curve to be similar to this, but not go down as far, and also turn a little bit further to the right. Like this. Okay, so we're assuming the bromine bromine one. Notice again, here's the trough for bromine bromine. It's a little bit to the right, and it so it doesn't come down as far. Okay, that's representing the fact that it has a bigger bond length, so the bond length would be distance from from here to here. Whereas for uh, chlorine, it was from here to here. So again, we see that difference. And then in terms of energy, bromine, bromine has less energy than chlorine, chlorine. And that's it. That's what this is all about as far as I'm concerned. And we're going to stop there before we go into ionic solids.